Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Paper Doll Houses. We have a wonderful show today. Um, we have Michael back on. We're doing another great topic. We're going to be talking about um, the show You and how the show You reflects on today's society. Uh, we're going to be breaking down how we see the show and how we viewed the show and kind of um, basically everything that we've seen kind of go from there. And so, Michael, tell me your viewpoint on the show. Um, the basic view is I don't think it goes for all of society. Uh, it does go for a very, very small percentage of society. Like, well, like any part of society is very small sections, very small areas. Um, I obviously saw two very broken, damaged people that had very toxic experience of relationships. They saw each other, saw what they liked to see. And decided to attempt to make a healthy relationship. And for a time they did. While lying to each other and to themselves the entire time. Because they were not being real and authentic. They weren't touching on real issues of a relationship to grow and develop from friendship, boyfriend-girlfriend, engaged. And all that, you need to meet family, you need to meet friends. You need to see how life meshes together. They didn't do any of that. No, no. And um, two characters for me, Joe and Beck, uh, they were interesting because Beck seemed to be very insecure. And not only was she lying herself, she had such a traumatic background that led her into being attracted to someone like Joe. And Joe seemed to be, you know, for the most part, he seemed to be this attractive, nice, easygoing guy. And then he has a dark side himself. So these two toxic people got into this relationship and just kind of all hell broke loose. Yeah. I saw just manipulation from the beginning, from the way Beck dressed to the way Joe talked to how he a- overanalyzed a few things. And just even his boldness and his just blatant disrespect and how he talked to her on many occasions, especially during their, just introductions like, oh, yeah, you're cute, F this, F that, whatever, whatever. And, hey, you want to go home? You want to go to bed? <laughs> but she was she was kind of used to that. And you mentioned something about the way she dressed, and so we don't have a bunch of people yelling at us. Um, that can also be a thing as well, because we're going to talk about more like the psychological things of Beck and <laughs> Joe. Um, and I'm, we're only paraphrasing mainly the show because we want you guys to really go watch it for your own and get your own idea of it. But for Beck, she wasn't just trying to get attention all the time. She was trying to find herself in other people. Well, there, there lies the issue. She was trying to find herself in others. Yeah. And in all that, um, as you continue, to watch, if you do choose to watch the show, you'll see that even her, what she considered her friends, mm-hmm. they were seeking themselves in other people as well or mm-hmm. other people's money, mm-hmm. as the case is. Um, where no one was really authentic in the entire, <laughs> in all of that. The only authentic people there were, were Paco, yeah. and Joe's assistant, and the nurse we meet later on. Paco was interesting, though. Well, Paco was... Because at the end. <laughs> well, Paco is, if anything, if you were to watch the show, uh, to everyone out there, you would see this is, Paco is like the prequel of Joe. <laughs> Yeah. In a lot of ways. I said the same thing. Um, and it's a very scary thought because the kid had was very had a very twisted view of authority, especially police. Um, um you'll see that Paco has a very twisted view on authority, especially police. Um, and if you were to watch the show, so you out there You'll see what I mean, but I don't want to give that away because it's a fantastic development. Not a very happy development, but the storytelling is what I'm talking about. The storytelling was well done Yeah. to ch- show this character. Um, and for all we know, there's examples all across our country and even around the world that, that Paco is real. And the abuse of power. Mm-hmm. Especially in a child's life, too. Yep. 
I do, I do like the idea of what you said about Paco. There are a lot of Pacos in our world. I feel so sorry for him because he was so conflicted towards the end. Um, especially because, and for those that I'm not trying to give away, but his, his family dynamic and how that was set up yeah. and then how he got to see Joe and how Joe became his savior. But then in the end, he got to see Joe in a different light yeah. and he still chose to protect Joe. That was interesting. Yeah. For, for me, when I saw that development, it, it even showed in my own life and I'm sure it can show in other people's lives. Even if you don't watch the show, sometimes the monster or not the monster, uh, sometimes you choose the lesser of two evils mm -hmm. or of what's greater benefit to you, what you're able to deal with and handle or what you're choosing to do. That's actually true. So everything we're going back to like last week, everything's a choice. So yeah. you even mentioned the nurse. She was one of my favorite characters as well, because she had her own way of deciding to do what she wanted to do. Yeah. She didn't, she didn't choose herself to put herself in that relationship. She wasn't Joe's target. Joe was just utilizing her until his target became available again, um, which is what narcissists or sociopaths tend to do. Mm -hmm. um, but what she did was she was very strong and she always was in charge. And even when she broke up the relationship, she was in charge. Yeah, but you could still tell that she was devastated by it Yeah, because that was months of her life. And she there was probably an element for that felt, you know what? I'm in this relationship. And I don't get into relationships lightly. Yeah. Because I see how the world works for my, the position she's in. But the way Joe did it, I could tell that, and again, this is just writing. It's, it's a fiction, of course, but still there are elements of real life that she kind of saw it coming. Yeah. She saw the signs, especially in the, in the wrap up week, essentially. Um, and then even seeing him afterwards, back with Beck. And yeah, that's your spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, I mean, like we know every relationship movie normally goes, the person falls in love and they break up and then they have a tragic thing and then they come back yeah. together. And this one though, but, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <sighs> that one's interesting. And then there's a season two, which is really interesting. Yeah. Especially the release date being right before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gift for all you sociopath lovers. Easy. Um, Look, this is why the, the majority of people who watched it were women, which was really disheartening because a lot of women are kind of jumping on the sociopath yeah. train lately. Yeah, and if anything for that to that point, and again, we're not I don't want to get into like gender roles or anything, that kind of nonsense, but because of the different viewpoints there are, this is also a very inter very important story to tell for men. Yeah. To say, Hey guys, yeah, are you do you see patterns of this? Yeah. In you, whether you're Joe or Beck. Yeah. Or even Joe's dad. Well, then, you know what? If we're going to talk about different characteristics, um, Joe, Joe's assistant, the Joe's neighbors, mm -hmm. Joe's neighbor's boyfriend. <laughs> and then was that it? All the, the three key men they were pointing out. I'm sure there were others, but those were the ones that were. And Paco. If you want to talk about toxic masculinity on different levels. Well, then he, that's, he had all those elements put on him, Paco. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, like I was saying, this is also an important story for men because mm -hmm. um, even in a common relationship, people are like, oh, the romantic comedy, my girl wants to go see this movie, that movie. Go see that movie. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Just like Ryan Reynolds once said, your baby, your girl, your, your wife just pushed out a child through a quarter. Change the diaper. Do the work. Thank you. Yeah. Um, again, some stories, yeah, they're difficult to watch and they'll make you squirm and maybe not. Maybe you won't want to look at yourself in the mirror sometimes, but these are important things to look at. And yeah, this is media that we're talking to about. But the reality is you got to look at yourself in the mirror sometimes. Mm -hmm. You got to, you know, write it out, journal it out. Um, if you're religious, you know, do what your religion calls to do. I myself, I am a born again Christian. That means I pray, I read the Bible, and I go to services uh, at my church. And that works for me. If it works for you, awesome. And yeah, part of it is I want to see everyone saved like that, but I'm not here pushing that. I'm just saying you have to make a choice in this. You have to 
do the work for yourself so you can be a healthier person. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with you. And the reason why we, we specifically chose this topic and that um, particular show is because ironically, every character on that show um, has to deal with what we do within society today. So um, you have the sociopath stalker who comes from a very broken childhood who doesn't know who he is at all because he comes from a house that doesn't exist. He has no parents. Mm -hmm. Then you have the girl who comes from a two parent household, but a divorced household. And what was it like a drunken father? No, daddy almost died from an OD. Okay. So he was a drug addicted. And, father. He wit and she witnessed that. Okay. And then that was her favorite. And then he abandoned her. So she has and terms of abandonment. And then told the story of my dad's dead. Okay. Because in her heart, her dad was dead. Yes. So she created all this animosity and right. anger over the years, which led her into all her toxic relationships. Yeah, which allowed her, well, not, I can't say allowed her, but that's what she manipulated herself, I would say. Yeah. To say, oh, yeah, this is okay. I don't mind if he's beating me or manipulating me or cheating on me. He's my boyfriend. That's what he does. Because it's something she was already accustomed to. Exactly. And then we have the shot. Well, I call him the shopkeeper, but his assistant is actually my favorite person on the entire show because you said that he's very awkward and silly and this and this, but it's in my opinion, he's very humble mm -hmm. and he already knew who he was. He didn't have to change anything about him. Yeah. He owns his awkwardness and he even recognizes it by the interactions he has with Joe where Joe just like, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. And Joe's always trying to struggle to fit in anyway. Right. And he, yeah, he has his own major league issues. <laughs> While his assistant is like, hey, I'm going to play the mandolin. Hey, I'm going to play some Kanye West. Hey, I'm going to play some Pharrell. Hey, that chick that just walked in with really big boobs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he doesn't care. He is who he is and he owns it in every aspect. And then as you see in the show later, he actually gets with one of Beck's friends and they have a very healthy and yeah. very dynamic relationship yeah and it's funny you said about beck's friend too because beck used to idolize after her and in the show beck's friend actually gave a brief synopsis of her own background which is i think this was key important why they pointed it out that's right and the, she uh, talked the about fat girl syndrome yeah and then but she was also talking about like how she grew up in yeah. a household and she knew swedish and all this different stuff and she's very happy go lucky mm -hmm. and she didn't have a lot of stress to deal with which led her to meet the really humble guy. So all of that, it was almost like she did her own necessary inner work, figured out who she was, took a stand for what she was going to do, determined that she was, she was going to be a writer where like Beck wasn't, she was all right. over the place. And there was also a point in the show, that same friend, they had some infighting with, in, within the group where uh, social media was used. Oh yeah. And it turned it turned the group against each other. It wasn't that, that just shows you that's not your it, friends. Exactly. It was very petty and it showed just how much of an airhead a lot of people were. And yeah, she hurt, got hurt from it. And she said, you know what? Yeah. So what? I was the fat girl in high school, but I was happy and I had this group of friends and we grew up together. So I don't care. Yeah, and so then one person took her money and her power, which is abuse of power and finances, and she was the one who tried to destroy the other person's career based off of how something she felt. Right. But then... So uh, Machiavellianism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. I guess. Uh, but then <laughs> the idea of karma, you yeah. know, or what you put out, what you get back, she didn't go on the attack. She said, you know what? That's going to be her. She's going to attack me, whatever, whatever. I'm going to keep doing me. And so as she kept on doing her, she became an even greater success than when she was getting the promotion and the accolades from that group of friends. True. And even with Peach's karma, which is, <laughs> that was just interesting all the way around. Cause she had, she was female Joe. She was, she, you know what? She really was. She was female rich Joe. She was. <laughs> and the only power that she had over Beck was her power was her financial power. Yeah, the financial support that she forced upon Beck. Yeah. Yeah, with the that's why Beck never took the check for her apartment. She took the check. No, I thought she ripped it up. I barely remember that part. Oh. <laughs> but still it was it was just so forced upon her. Yeah. Now let's talk about one more rich Joe. Benji. 
the boy. Oh, that guy. Ooh, that was fun. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, and I mean that very sarcastically, of course. Um, yeah. What, what do you want to ask about Benji? Um, for Benji, I want to say, uh, <laughs> I know, because that one's a difficult one. That one's really ironic. Is it? Because he's the one that warned Joe about Beck. Well, he warned Joe about Beck or and or Beck about Joe, however you want to look at it. But he himself was already wrapped up in his own, own little world. Yeah, no. And he couldn't see the forest for the trees. Yeah. I mean, he was, he had money. You know, he had a trust fund and he was trying to make this artisanal soda. Soda, yeah. And like, it's like, so what? Who cares? Just do it or not. Yeah. Now, that's my perspective on that. But he had his own version of manipulation because he was paying the bill. He was paying Joe, uh, Beck's bills. I see. I didn't even catch that until now. Uh, he was paying, he was paying Beck's bills. The right up until meeting Joe and then Joe does his deal. Um, and, uh, Benji just treated Joe or treated Beck as a commodity, not as a person, not as a woman, not as a person at all. Just, Hey, I'm paying your bills and I'm going to have sex with you. Um, I don't care about your needs on any level, except there's a roof over your head so that I can bang you at. Yeah. And that's it. He was extremely selfish. I'm not saying that he got what he deserved because nobody deserves to be dispatched like that. Um, however, I think they could have done something different with Benji. Um, I think we are just trying to over high, is it hollow Hollywood it. Cause yeah. I, it, Benji was a difficult character to begin with. Yeah. They wrap, they quite literally wrapped him up, uh, pretty well. I think. They, that was interesting. Even I won't even get into that. That's just funny. But I mean, not funny. I I have a sick sense of humor. Um, for mm. Beck, for Beck's character, <laughs> uh, you said um something about Benji and he warning about her and paying the bills. So daddy issues. She has developed her father issues. We know that dad was drunk and abusive. This is not. Mm -hmm. So Benji took that place. And then now Benji's taking care of her. And so she, because she's accustomed to it happening now. Yeah, she was accustomed to be taken care of rather than yeah. working for herself. Which is, which is what she had the crisis when yeah. she was about to lose her place. Well, that, and she even was even talking throughout. Uh, and this actually feels like it's being a show analysis. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, and that I would say, <sighs> Beck already had kind of a sense of herself because she's a grown woman in many respects. Mm -hmm. And she had a job. She was trying to be a writer, even though not really. But she even knew herself that she was in a toxic environment and she wanted to get out somehow, some way. Granted, her friend Peaches had her own motives uh, to get her out of there and help her. But yeah, Beck didn't have didn't have any option, any really good options yeah. around her. Um, until later in the series, you see. She had a really good option before her, but she didn't take it. Yeah. Um, like on any level, and she had the opportunity, she had motive, she could have gotten out. <laughs> she could have. Um, so. But she was afraid to be on her own person, I think. No, and that's actually, so I know you guys are probably figuring out why are we touching on this one particular show. We're not trying to break down this one particular show. We're just trying to expose something here. Um, and I guess the key word for this entire show is codependency and every character on that show, except the healthy couple couple all had a need for to be codependent. Mm -hmm. And that's because, and that is every literal character on that show is all codependent. So, and, and they even have background breakdowns of their lives. I think this is more important than watching the aspect of the relationship or even being stalked in a relationship. I think we need to look at deeper the codependency in our society, how we view codependency and how maybe we can try to get people to be like that cult, the couple, the, the individuals that got married that mm -hmm. were actually decent. The healthy couple. Yeah, the healthy. Yeah. But that's because they were healthy people to begin with before they became a couple. Yeah, because they accepted who they were. And they were trying to, in their own way, they were trying to 
get the people around them to accept them who they were. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, just every time, uh, I, it, it sucks that I keep forgetting the assistant's name. I don't know his name either. <laughs> I can't think of it. But uh, the fat Asian dude. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways, he was always getting on Joe's case about, hey, what about this? What about that? Mm-hmm. Can we do something about the store? Can we do this? Can we do that? He was always interested in bettering the store and be- thereby bettering Joe. Even when he saw that him and Beck were toxic for each other, mm-hmm. he even encouraged it. Like, hey, man, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure this is the right thing for you to do? And even with Beck's friend, the one that he got married to, she um, she would encourage Beck to be better with her writing. She would be encourage Beck to do with her with her studies, mm-hmm. what she should do to become a writer. She even read her own writing. She was like, I thought it was phenomenal, you know, and to get a compliment from her was a huge deal for Beck. So this woman was trying to teach Beck how to be a better woman. She wasn't even focused on a relationship. Mm-hmm. And then when they got together and they had them move, they were trying to play matchmaker to bring them back together and have them. I guess both yeah. help him move. Yeah, but in a healthy manner. In a healthy manner, um, to have him talk at least. You know, because that, that's a natural thing. I mean, I've encountered it myself, and we've probably even seen it in other situations where there's a healthy couple, and they have their friends, and they say, hey, let's bring them together. We it's want that, you to be as happy as we are. Exactly. Everything. And not in, in a so overt neon sign. This is your soulmate. <laughs> but, hey, you know, you get along. They get along. We're all friends. Let's see if this works. Right. And if it doesn't, oh well. And we, we're the also the pattern here is creating healthy non codependent relationships creates healthy non codependent children. Right. Um, however, it can be argued that codependency is not in itself a bad thing. I'm I mean, talking about from the negative aspect. Right. Well, I'm I'm referring to it as a partnership. Okay. Yeah. Because codependency as a partnership is not codependency. It is a partnership. Yeah. You have a task. I have a task. Right. You can't figure it out. Let me help you. Yeah. But at the same time, we're not stifling each other's partnership. Well, in the case that we see on the show, it's, it's, oh, you can't do this for yourself. I'll do everything. I'll do everything. I'll do everything. Oh, you're going to play with my balls? Okay. Which actually, which is what's funny. It's with Joe when he had to go move the bed. So that was, (laughs) well, you know, I'm going to bring that part up. So when he helped her, went and got the bed for her, he went and put the entire bed together for her. Mm. And then she slept with someone else on top of the bed. I mean, he watched her across the street, which was really, I don't even want to get into all that because it just got really weird. But yeah, it got really weird. But then the the shopping also got weird. (laughs) Yeah. Everything about that show was kind of weird. But, um, the point where he was watching her sleep with someone else, um, yeah, let's take away everything, the, the awkwardness around it. And then let's just break that part down. He did something over the top for someone he really liked. And because this person's so broken, she took all his kindness and did something else with it. And this is that circle of mistrust started. Right. So they were already toxic. And she was using him and then turn. she was using a sociopath and then turning around, going back to her. Was it like really narcissistic ex-boyfriend? And it just got, it just got messy all the way around. So she, in a way she's a sociopath without all the killing. Yeah. And I mean, that's scary to say, cause nobody wants to put Beck in the position of the, the yeah, exactly. attacker. I guess, but with media, um, and this is from a media perspective and part of society, I guess nobody wants to look at the woman as the bad guy. Yeah. On any level. Like I'm going to say something that it's probably going to get a little bit. hate. Brie Larson as captain Marvel overrated, way overrated. She has not earned her fandom yet. I'm not saying she's a bad actor. I'm not saying the character is a bad character. I'm saying for the hype and the promotion she has, it is still unearned, unproven. Okay. <laughs> I just know her in Scott Pilgrim and United States of Terra. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and also Kong Skull Island. She did excellent. See, I haven't seen all of the, all of Bree's work. I'm sorry. I love you, Bree, though. Great actress. Yeah, just probably not for that role. In his opinion, in his opinion. I'm I haven't not, even seen I it yet. did not say that. Oh, sorry. For that role, she works. But yeah. for the love and adoration and okay. all the, she is goddess. Okay. Unearned. I can see. <laughs> Especially considering she only had about thirty minutes, uh, actually about fifteen-ish minutes of sh- runtime in the last Avengers movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and see, we're we're saying this because we're trying to showcase that 
not everybody needs to be glorified as well. Um, and it, you know, um, I think it was, wasn't it like a, a Kubrick film? Like, uh, Stanley Kubrick did the, um, what is it called? Clockwork Orange. Ooh. So Clockwork Orange was the first introduction to a rape scene being put into a movie. And it was supposed to be controversial because Stanley Kubrick was trying to take away the ideals that everything is taboo. And it's there. It's really out there, but we just don't want to talk about it. Even there was an adaptation called Funny Games who did the same thing where they showed a child's death because it's supposed to show these things are real. They happen, unfortunately. And as much as you don't like them, they're real. A little boy got shot and killed in the movie. I'm still messed up. I'm still talking about it. Eight years later, I have not watched that movie again. I can't. If anything, to that same vein, we could talk about the movie The Kids. Okay. That was highly toxic. Um, Set in New York, a bunch of teenagers that the whole goal of the movie or one of the main characters was, hey, I'm going to have sex with two girls at once. Or two girls in the same day. Same 24-hour span. And in that, there was drugs and violence and a couple of people got massively hurt one got killed and he made his goal like big mouth not like big mouth but all along the same levels but this movie was raw uh, I felt maybe well shot but I felt that movie was perhaps well shot and okay acted but not a good movie in any sense of the word. Um, and it was shock value for the sake of shock value rather than for a social commentary. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm mentioning the, the stuff with the innocence. So the corrupting innocent things too. Um, and I even brought up big mouth because that was just, <laughs> actually, yes, like that even though I'm goody goody as people might look at it, I have watched the show. I appreciate what it's trying to do. Is it a good message? Probably no. not. <laughs> but you know what? He's talking about things that people are not willing to talk about. As young children in junior high, we did experience those things. We just didn't talk about them. And we and, didn't know how to talk about And them. because it was an open thing. Right. So when the show Big Mouth, I actually came to this conclusion the other day. I actually am very appreciative the show came out. Because it shows what a lot of our younger children are dealing with mentally mm-hmm. on a day-to-day basis when they're going through puberty, when they're dealing with hormones and as, as kitschy as it can be, or as a little uncomfortable as it can be, because it is involving children mm-hmm. and involving the, the topic of sex. Right. Um, it's, I think a lot of parents need to watch it. Yeah. Especially because again, it's talking about those issues, but it's also showing the creativity from a child's point of view. Yeah. It's like, okay. I'm going through these changes, so there's this creature, there's yeah. this monster, however you want to look at it. Um, they're talking about a subject, subjects that are very awkward to talk about, um, but it, it touches on the creativity of how kids may, may, may look at these yeah. things. <laughs> um, like, look at these guys, they all have similar imagination. Oh, okay, hormones, male, female, bad monsters, good monsters, whatever. Um, and so they see, oh, okay, well, why not? You know, why not have this monster, this creature, or whatever? And the idea of shame being an embodiment in itself and him admiring shameful things that people do not like, people do not want to like. The town. Yeah. I, I even liked it because, um, for the, the characters in the show, not only were they dealing with a lot and they were trying to figure out a lot of stuff, um, like I said, a lot of adults don't connect with their children anymore. Yeah. So they, these children on the show, they're dealing with their sexual orientation. They're dealing with their sexuality. They're dealing with the pressures of society through each other right. and through a made up, basically their own inner thoughts. Right. And also they touch on, even if it's not sexuality or the sexual orientation, it's my body is a chemical nightmare right now. Yes. And I'm trying to make sense of it. And I'm trying to live life as well as go to school. You know, I'm and- trying to live life. I noticed that my best female friend, um, and they're noticing that their best friends of the opposite sex is like, oh, yeah, you're my friend. Oh, 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 all yeah. right. I like what I see now. 
Yeah, and Let's then figure this out. Yeah, and then that's it, a, a good introduction into puberty, which is also good, guys, that we talk about this too because it does relate back to the first one with you and the the view of our society of how our children are dealing with themselves on a day to day basis, and they become form fitting adults in this society who has to figure themselves out because these kids from Big Mouth and these adults from you are pretty much, unfortunately on the same wavelength because these these adults didn't grow up in you the the one from you they 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 became adults um that have more access to things but mentally are still children who are still trying to figure it all out because i feel like if joe had the proper help mental help and he figured himself out as a man better then he could have found a better relationship or he could have I don't know, moved away from that place. If Joe had actually contacted the police at some point. <laughs> As a child, yeah. Okay, it's like, yeah. hey, bookstore owner has a cage that he locked me in yeah. the basement. He didn't touch me, but he imprisoned me there. Which is what he ended up doing later on in life. He imprisoned someone else that was similar to him. Right. And, well, a couple people. <laughs> and murdered a few people. And I, I, that's why I'm <laughs> with these characters and these children and they're dealing with everything that they're dealing with and Joe and needing to find the help as a child. The, this is, this is why this show is kind of interesting because we're not just touching on a, a show topic, but it's, it's, I like movies and shows because they're showcasing things that you probably need to see anyway. And right. we're just breaking down what you need to see anyway. You don't have to really go watch these shows. Right. If you want to, you can. Netflix, we're not endorsing you, but you can endorse us. That'd be great. That'd be nice. Yeah. But, um, the, the thing about it with, with you and with Big Mouth and different shows like this is showcasing that a lot of our children, a lot of our youth, even kids, um, they're growing up with like Paco in these bad situations and then they become adults in this really hate filled, crazy world mm -hmm. to where they don't know who they are as an individual. They're placed into several different categories. They're placed into several different mental places. There's under a lot of you pressure. Go to that one? I mean we can. Because <laughs> <laughs> they they even have shows basically. Uh, no, you want to touch on the whole autism spectrum and how nonsensical that is? We can't. <laughs> And that'd be interesting for right. me because no, it's nothing bad. I would like to actually hear your your viewpoints. I have my own personal viewpoints mm -hmm. as a mother who has a child with autism. Yeah. Um, my personal opinion is, and I'm probably going to get a lot of backlash. Bring it. Um, a lot of stress that a woman goes through during her pregnancy. So, so you think stress is a trigger to autism? Well, what I'm what I'm getting at. So the way that a fetus is created in the human body. And the way that it's connected to the human body, um, the the stress the fetus feels the whatever stress the mother's feeling the the whatever the mother is feeling at that time is what the fetus is feeling. So if you do the research way back, you know, in that time where they had through every child that had came out with like a mental retardation, they threw them into an asylum. The birth rates for mental what health back then versus now is pretty low, right? It's I don't know the numbers to that. Okay, so then I have to look up the numbers later. So nobody quote me until I get these numbers together. <laughs> but my personal opinion, um, because the mother suffers through that stress or the mental stress, I feel like the fetus goes through that mental stress with her. So as it grows, you know, the, the brain develops. Just fun fact, when a woman's body goes through things and she has a son inside of her womb, the son can feel that the woman's body is hurt or she's sick and he sends up certain cells to heal his mother. That's where I feel mm -hmm. like the, the woman connected to the fetus, all this life stressful situations, finances, uh, housing situations, relationship situations, anything that comes with it, she could be bearing a very overstressed child, which has led to brain function. Um, slow down. Okay. Well, I can see that to a point. But then what about the uh, affluent family that they've been trying to get pregnant forever or they easily get pregnant and they also have a mentally retarded child. Like they have no financial stress. They have no marital stress. Mm. Is there a genetic fluke? I didn't even think about that. Because I personally, ha I know a couple. They are very well off. They show no signs of stress to the outside world. I don't know them very intimately yeah but 
their son is like the happiest little goofball you could ever meet. <laughs> and yeah, he is mental, mentally disabled, but he doesn't let him get him down. And I know yeah. they had a hard pregnancy. I know they did have a hard pregnancy. Yeah. Um, so. Because people want to put a lot of blame on the vac- the vaccines. Yeah. And yeah, but, mental retardation has been around forever. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, is that when my daughter was born, I could tell something was very different with her because she screamed for hours mm-hmm. rather than going to sleep. She did not have her shots. She didn't have a. So in my opinion, it didn't come from any, for me, for any vaccinations. For me, it was the, the situation and the environment that I was involving myself in at the time. Right. And everything that I was involved with and all the stress that I was involved with at the time. So I felt like that was my reasoning for her. Because I, I always wanted to know. I was always very curious of what was the root of why a child is autistic. Honestly, no matter what the diagnosis might be, I don't think there is one key factor. I'm sure it's several. I'm sure it's none. I'm sure it's a whole mixture of anything. Um and there's no real tracking of it. Like I know in Germany, they've tried to, they've tried and in some cases succeeded passing policy of if you have genetic markers where your child is going to come out mentally disabled, we're going to terminate before the birth. Yeah. And I know at up to 50, age 15, <clears throat> um, there's been some countries that have had policy if you're 15 years or younger you are simply a burden to society Mm -hmm. and those decisions were made and those people no longer live. That's terrible. And they use the same policy for their senior citizens because they're they're just that old and that much of a burden on society to their perspective. Is that population control? Yes, absolutely. That's terrible. And of course the arguments are back and forth with population control, resource management and I know we went way off on our main topic there, but that's why I'm I'm a huge proponent of conservationism. And that simply means you have resources before you. You do not force your ideas upon one another. You simply make a better way. That doesn't sound like you went off topic. You literally just described that very humble, healthy couple. But you just put it in society view. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what it is. It's taking that approach and putting it in a very positive manner to make it work. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I know I say off topic, but it's because we went on to a totally different realm. Yeah, no. to look at it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's where I get a little confused on occasion. I know. I'm sorry. Um, no, just... that's fine. fine. Um, I just learned that about myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, population control, uh, a pregnant mother that births an autistic child or some similar disabled, there are no very clear cut factors, but there is treatment. Yeah. There are options to help and grow and develop that child. Yeah. Because I mean, even what we look at now in our mental health uh, circles, there's not a lot of good. <laughs> the, no. Because it's really not. Okay. I, I, I'm probably going to catch a little bit of flack on this one, but when you look at the autism spectrum, mm-hmm. it's. Everything. Yeah. They basically consider everything to be a mental disability. Yeah. To the point where if you really look very closely at it, you're mentally disabled. Everyone viewing this thing as mentally disabled, I'm mentally disabled. Yeah. All of society is mentally disabled by um, how sociologists, psychiatrists, and psychologists have broken down society to such a point that no one is even capable of operating. And because I just... (laughs) I just want to say something to that. There's a point where you could be called intellectually disabled or even have ADD. My personal opinions of those is that you're so stressed out from every, the expectations, Mm -hmm. how society views, how everything we're supposed to do to fit into this structure. All those expectations will make any mind wander because you're not supposed to literally be going through the stress every single day. Oh, absolutely not. We're not supposed, we're supposed to be humans that live every single day, but the problem is we're going to, so you put that much expectations Mm -hmm. on a child. You have to do this, have to do this, have to do that, have to do this. Eventually after a while, I'm not going to want to concentrate on the text. I want to go frolic in the sun for five minutes. 
that doesn't make me ADD. That just makes me a human who wants to breathe for five minutes. So I, I absolutely agree with you because sometimes I can't focus. Sometimes I get ultimately distracted. I'll see a, I saw two kittens. I was, I, that's me. I saw two kittens in the back of someone's car today and I was musing over my day today and I was like, oh, look, there's two kittens in the car because that's what our brain does. It's because our brain wants that break. Our brain wants that break. And because our brain wants that break, that's why they can easily call us that. And that's why that spectrum is so big yeah. because I actually did a, a show called on autism spectrum on, you know, we're talking about, the, and I remember one lady who is autistic, who was on my show. She said that everyone is basically autistic, mm-hmm. that it, it doesn't matter who you are. You're going to be categorized as autistic. Oh, it, absolutely. I completely 100% agree. I've had that idea for a long time. Yeah. Um, and yet, Scientifically, there's no proof of that one way or the other. Yeah. Um, because it's just your idea of what it is. And whoever is in control of the diagnoses or however that panel works, they're the ones making that decision ultimately. Yeah. When the reality is they look at it and they compare their own testing on their own selves, they qualify. <laughs> yeah. Um, but going back to what I was saying about the autism spectrum, because they're so because it covers such a wide variety of uh, mental disability. Um, like as of a few years ago, they removed the label of Asperger's oh. at one point when you were diagnosed with Asperger's, they had a treatment plan. They had a medication plan. They had therapy plans. Okay. So they had a way of treating that, um, that realm. Okay. But since they took it back and put it all under autism, those individuals are not getting the help they used to have. It's terrible. Though. And it just throws them in the mix. It's like, yeah, well, that's not helping me. Every And uh, like, if you work in the special needs community, everyone's got a different need. Yeah. Everyone's got different abilities. They can figure things out. They can manipulate. Yeah. They can twist things around and they can, they're, a lot of them are smarter than people realize mm. or um, psychologists even give them credit for or even want to give the credit for. Yeah. All that to say, there's choices that we need to make as individuals and even society as a whole, but it always starts with the individual. If you got someone that needs help, you help them. If you have a codependency, you go you go with the people that actually will want to help you. Yeah. That will actually help you, not manipulate you and throw you in a cage and say, I'm paying your bills, so you owe me this. Yeah. You know, it's like, no. You're hungry? Let me feed you. Right. You're thirsty? Let me give you a drink. You're cold? Let me give you a jacket or a blanket. So that's a difference between power of control versus being more empathetic and being more humble and open and aware. So yeah, in a way that this show is literally showing the difference in our society, the difference between being very powerful and, and taking your brokenness and being more hurtful towards people or saying, Hey, I'm going to help you yeah. be a better person. Yeah, and it even people, everyone needs healing in some way. Yeah, yeah. And and there's nobody can say today that they've been healed completely and then they walk with no transgressions. That's not possible. Even the top is the top top is the top person who is out there being the best life coach who's making millions to trillions of dollars a year. They, they got issues ha- too. They still have issues and they still need to heal from certain I, things. Not only do they have issues, but they're dealing with all your crap. Right. So they got to take on other people's emotions, other people's trauma and issues, help them figure that out and then go back and fix their. That's a lot of work for mm-hmm. someone to do that. And that's why I give credit to psychologi- psychiatrists that actually do the job. Yeah. That actually help people. Yeah. Because not only are they helping that person deal with those issues. But they're dealing with their own issues. Yeah. And they're also dealing with people that are dealing with it. So, yes. Yeah. And maybe all the, ra- the ramifications thereof and trying to figure out, okay, is this person actually hurting themselves? Or are they making a joke? Or are they doing that? Da, 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 da. And yet they still function. Yeah. They have an, they make themselves an outlet of some sort. Yeah. They probably even see their own shrink. Yeah. And they really do. Um, I, I don't know what show I was watching, but it was about a therapist and the therapist had a therapist. So he was one of the top therapists, but that top therapist had his own therapist, Mm -hmm. which was like the second top therapist out there. (laughs) And it made me laugh because I'm like, see, this showcases that even the most best therapist that can give you the best life advice or tell you go fix yourself still has their own problems. Exactly. And they'll go talk about their own patients. This patient drove me crazy today. And, and it's because, people deal with things every single day so it's not possible for anyone to be fully healed and go help a bunch of people they still yeah. have it's a process and, and all that to say 
there's no shame in asking for help. Yeah. There's no shame in saying, hey, I can't figure this out. Yeah. We all got something to figure out. Some people just, well, they're better at it than others. Some people are way worse than others. Yeah. And there's some people, and you'll probably see it in your day-to-day, they will not seek help, whether it be because they can't or they won't. That's right. Mm, sorry. <laughs> whether they can't or they won't, that's not for you to decide. But if they come to you, I would suggest be available. And if you're not able to, help them. Help them in some way. Yeah. It's funny because I wanted to touch on another topic, but we'll probably do that for another time. It was actually on the show Russian Doll. <laughs> and um, because Russian Doll actually talks about healing from trauma. Mm. That was... Um, it's a really uh, great show. Maybe we'll talk about it next time, but they even bring up the problem of not just healing from a past ego, but also drugs and how to use drugs in a positive manner. So I'm, I'm not saying I want to say, Oh yeah, let's do these drugs in a positive. I'm just saying when they brought it up, I'm like, Oh no. Oh no. So when you said, um, about how Asperger children can't get the necessary, well, they're no longer diagnosed as that. So they have no um... access to the, well, they have access, but it's not uh, prescribed or directed access. Okay. Because it's done in such a roundabout way now. Okay. Because I, I remember I do have known, met a few people that were once diagnosed with Asperger's, but as soon as the DSD-9 said, no more Asperger's, yeah, they lost all those services. That's a shame. They went from making progress, driving their own car, getting That's a, a job, and having those plans in place to... I don't know what I'm doing. Poor babies. And they, there's a stat there. The reason why I had, I did the autism show was because the death rate um, is between the ages of uh, 55 and se- I want to say 80 something. But or no, not 80. Excuse me. 55 and 60. So it was a very young age. That still seems about the national average. But they said that the reason why it was ma- Well, the woman who told me she's autistic, she said it's because of suicide. I said, why is the, why is the average so big on suicide? And she said, it's because they get to a certain point where maybe their family members have died off. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to really care for, there's not many facilities to help them redirect themselves. Yeah. And it gets to an issue to where they can't do it anymore. They kill themselves. And that hurt me because I thought about my own daughter. So now I'm just drilling all this self-sufficient stuff in her head. And, and I'm not, I mean, she's fine. I don't want to keep putting too much pressure on her, right. but. At the same time, that's a fear of mine now. Yeah, well, the, again, there's I, there's uh, resources that I've listened to that I know of um, for that particular field. Yeah. Um, that there can be plans put in place, insurance policies put in place, medical mer- uh, medical funds put in place, that they can still get their services, they could be housed, um, depending on the budgeting. It probably won't be a great facility, but they'll have somewhere to go. I was going to say something, but would be, no. Um, <laughs> you know, cause I was like, will it be nicer than the ice facility? Uh, uh-huh. So the, <laughs> the, there's a housing center for their children and they, they have a... But anyway, do you feel like if finances were not a big deal in America, if money did not exist, if, if trade was the only thing that we had to function off of, do you think we'd be a better society? Are you referring to if currency did not exist in any of human history? At one point, a Republican mentioned, and I agree with her to this day, and I know I'm just, I don't care what you guys think, but she mentioned that we should go back to bartering and trading. Two cows, chickens, fur, yeah. this, this, and that. Everybody, that was the dumbest thing in the world. Okay. I thought it was amazing. Okay, I see where that question was going to. Okay. I honestly think that a barter system being put in place in addition to currency as we are as a society now would be beneficial because people would trade good for good, business for business. They talk more. There'd be communication. There'd be negotiation. Right. There'd be understanding. Better teaching for the children, too. Mm, to a point, depending on the environment they, they were coming from. Okay. Because, I mean... All right, we look at uh, the drug culture. They do a lot of trades for drugs. True. True. Their trades are usually of a physical nature. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, yeah. Um, who's really benefiting from that? The drug dealer. Are they? All the way around. Are they're they? making 
Well, they're not making any money. They're getting. They're going to the clinic afterwards. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, I didn't think about that. But yeah, yeah. So yeah, so in that trade, everyone's life is getting shorter. But that's why I wanted to talk about the Russian doll with drugs. Because drugs is what we, you and I talked about personally was that drugs were more of an escape Mm -hmm. because of the mental anguish people are going through. And that was why I said there's a part in Russian Doll where they're talking about um, how Special K is now becoming more accessible to people who are going through things. I even read articles about magic mushrooms becoming more accessible. I've seen Coke. There's been places for heroin and Coke that you can go do. Yeah, methadone clinics. Yeah. and, And the reason for it being is because we just want in my personal opinion, we just want money. We're trying to get skilled laborers out yeah. here. Yeah, Let's... there's more methadone clinics than there are food banks. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of really Yeah, a food bank is about a tenth of the cost of a methadone clinic. And that's that's the shame. But the whole goal here, and like I said, in my opinion, it's to try to get people to work. They want a system that works. So what do you give them? You give them their pleasures. Well, again, that's the challenge as we are right now as a country people are about me 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 yeah they don't want to sweat for the money they don't want to work they don't want to get their hands dirty they just want the result yeah they have no concept especially our children they have no concept of where food comes from they have no idea where their clothes are coming from yeah um but some of us that are actually looking at it we see the actual evidence of there's a chinese kid in the middle of the shangxi province can't even afford the shoes that he just made you. That's and true. he probably got nailed on his hand a couple of times by either the overseer or the sewing machine. Yeah. And he's still got 12 hours left on his 14 hour shift. Yeah. While our kids are running around destroying their $80 shoes that we just bought them. Popping Adderalls because they don't know what to do with them. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's bad because we've become a business nation. We become a nation of expectations. We become a nation of over stress and anxiety and how we do, how we fix it. Uh, What I learned in class is that he calls it a salad bowl. So it's all the same issues, but we just throw some dressing on it, make sure it's okay. And I, 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 yeah. And I liked that because that's what we do. We put a blanket over situations like, Oh, you're dealing with stress and anxiety. Let's go ahead and fix the, the, the wage gap and the issues with the wages and stuff. (laughs) Right. Let's go make it fair for everyone to live and and survive. Instead of dealing with what's going on. Oh, you're dealing with stress. We're going to give you more stress on top of your stress, control your paycheck, control how you live, control how you breathe, eat and sleep. But. And then we're going to regulate it. Yeah. But here's a free drug access though. It's going to mess your body up, later, you know, long in the wrong, in mm-hmm. the long run. Um, it's going to mess your kidneys up. It might even cause your kidney failure. But look at you. We're, we're playing Darwinism now. We're now going to start killing off you, your family, because it's easier for us. So now we're going to be profiting off of your dead body. And we're still going to be profiting off of you even when you're working. Okay. Uh, well, sidebar, let's go. I, I understand where all that's coming from and where that's going. Me personally, I, I look at there's hope. Yeah. yeah. No matter what the issues are. Yeah, there's ungrateful children. There's child slavery, which is a horrible thing. And I'm not diminishing that in the least. Yeah. But there's solutions we can do now. It's the conversations we have. And it's not harping. And I, I, knew, I know I use that term, harping. But if we keep talking about what's wrong, but we don't come up with a solution. Yeah. Then what have we? We have more problems bunch of complaining <laughs> and that's why i look at the solutions like i'll offer someone a drink i'll offer someone food i will do extra stuff yeah if i hear about a family in need i do my best to be either a part of the solution or i am the solution yeah um like with children or i see or actually let's get back to our main topic if i see a friend of mine that's in a horrifyingly toxic relationship i'm going to shoot him a text i'm gonna give him a call i'm gonna sit him down i'm gonna put i'm gonna take him to a steak dinner and find out what's going on yeah um again if i see a friend of mine that uh again we're going to solutions here we can look at all the problems that we want we can cry about it we can scream about it we can yell about it we can have protests for god's sake and we're having a lot of them right now yeah which are really stupid in the most part, especially in this country. Why not come up with a solution? Because people don't want to work together. Exactly. So in 
And again, that's another gripe that they have too. People are saying, we can't work together. Have you tried? <laughs> well, because, okay. Once again, another reason why we, we are doing this particular show is because you guys do understand that the person behind Paper Doll Houses is a mixed woman. <laughs> and then we have a white male. And it's kind of cool because we both come, we, we both come from very opposite places. And we have our viewpoints on what we're seeing today. And like how, you know, you're saying the protests are bad. It's more of a, a voice needing to be heard sort of thing. But it's also because no one's really listening. It's like, it's like children screaming and fighting for something, but still the parents not listening. Okay. And I feel like that's kind of what's creating this egotistical, this egotistical society of, you know, because I've even seen um, people who've created these protests, they've created strength in numbers by like-minded individuals and mm. they'll go and find them in different counties, different countries, or it means me, different cities, different states. And They'll have the same protest, same uprising. They they organize it so well. My personal thing is, if we can organize a protest, why can't we organize a functional and economical society that everyone can do together? Yeah, that's what I was, part of what I was going to say. Um, with these organizers, if they are really about organizing something that they can do for an event, and yeah, that takes a lot of power. A lot, a lot well, not power, but that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a little bit of money sometimes. And to get the place and get the people there. Yeah. That takes a lot of organization. Now, take that same individual, that same group of individuals. Mm -hmm. How much more could they do by establishing a production company? Mm -hmm. Like, say, they do, they open up a farming community. How much benefit could they be? I, because they were all willing to put in a little bit of work. Yeah. To have all that effect. And here's where I have issue majorly with these protests. A lot of protests, they show up, they wreck the place, they have a lot of noise, but they don't say much. In my again, my opinion. And then they leave the place worse off than they were there. Then they turn around a couple of days, a couple of weeks later. Why hasn't there been change? Have you been involved in the change? Right. Are you playing the game, getting into a position where you can be looked at in respect? So we need a proactive leader that doesn't just teach on not even just having your voice being heard, but doing things behind the scenes. It's kind of like um, in constructing a entire building mm -hmm. behind the government's back without them knowing. And then all of a sudden, everyone that wants to be in unison together has created basically like a trickle down economy they've right. created their own structures they've created their own finances they've created their own community they've created their own everything like canada does and mm -hmm. you know because they, they segregate everyone they tell you can come over here you can do whatever it is that you want to do as long as you create your own community and they do and but they have their own structures they have to follow after so if we did that here if we just did that and then everybody worked together despite your color despite what you who, who you are and we rose up together we could possibly do something completely different that is possible um well, you're also referring to having hundreds of people maybe in thousands gathering under a single idea that's a challenge in and of itself i more refer to the changes like um there's been um a guy in india can't pronounce his name and i'm not gonna butcher his name <laughs> right he owned a piece of land on a small island off the coast of India. He saw that it was barren and he was in his own depression. And so he decided to start planting seeds on the island. He turned it from a barren, sandy strip into a fertile jungle that now houses, that now homes several, like, at least half a dozen, no, like two or three dozen elephants, monkeys, birds, all sorts of other creatures. That's on this, amazing. On this island that's barely a hundred acres in size. He in he allowed uh, government officials to bring the elephants there because there was no other place to put them. He said, yeah, bring them. So he created an ecosystem yeah. that works. In 30 years, all by himself. 
and there he has volunteers that show up and help him. That is that's and again quietly, not yelling, not in the streets, not nothing epic and big. He had no access to technology. He still doesn't have running water himself. Yeah, but he changed the environment of this small area. But it came out of his depression. He saw that he needed to do something. So he needed to make a change. And so instead of getting in his own head, he decided to do something. Yeah. Positive. Yeah. And now it positively affects elephants, the biggest land animal in the world. Right. And monkeys and birds and lizards and snakes. And we need that to and keep progress. Yeah. Exactly. Like talking about saving the bees, we joke about how those visco girls want to save the sea turtles, but mm -hmm. we don't realize what these animals do for our ecosystem. We just keep making jokes about what we want as humans rather than what these, because we don't educate anymore. You remember those zoology books that came out a long time ago? I and those yeah. Animals. And then, and then teaching about how the, how the, the pets are, or how the, the animals are doing for our system and what we should and shouldn't mm -hmm. have. And, and the education is all gone. It's more, I'm so disturbed with the amount of illiteracy that's around. I'm yeah. disturbed with the amount of uneducated people who are only surface level. Like there's no more love for research or even going. Yeah. Further. Here's an iPad. Here's a game. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't learn anything. I just taught my daughter don't migration the other day. Migration, just something about migration. Yeah. Cause we just saw birds in the sky. She wasn't interested. So I, I remembered back to where I was being taught and she loved it. So I, I've been doing that little things. I'll take her to the museum. I'll take them like everywhere and I'll teach them everywhere I go. This is this, this is this, this is that, because these are basic fundamentals. If, if cable went out, if TV went out, if satellites were gone and we were like Iran right now protesting over oil because that's what they are. And they shut out the entire, um, they shut out their entire internet. So they have no access to even raise their voices. Then what do you do? Like it's, it's going to happen. We have people controlling this environment that we're in right now. We're social media addicted because we're needing communication. That's why Facebook is profiting so much is because the need of communication is big. We can talk to each other online, but we cannot talk to each other in person. And that's what creates that animosity. That's what creates the stress. And in my personal opinion, that's what creates a lot of complicated relationships because because you're not connecting with people in your life. You don't know what you're supposed to be connecting to and then you end up getting in a toxic relationship. Right. Because you're trying to find methods of communication to somebody hear me type of thing. Yeah, it's like, yeah, somebody hear me. Are you hearing yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I just, I feel like that's, I don't know, that's just, that's my, honestly my opinion, how I see and view life and how our, feel, our children are growing up so uneducated. And like I said, they're just creating workers. They're even talking about taking the analog clocks out of the classrooms. Um, I actually already met people that don't know what an animal, how to read analog. Yeah, I I met and some. I'm like, that's just sad. Yeah, or cursive writing, that's yeah. being taken out because they're they're cutting to the chase now. They they don't have no interest in teaching the child to evolve to be a better human. Yeah, nobody want nobody's interested in the process. They want the result. Yeah, they're not even interested in, in beginning. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if you told a child that they had the choice between becoming an Amazon worker. Or owning their own Amazon, or they're owning their own business, then more than likely you're going to get the Amazon worker because it's easier. You're going to get, I feel like what they're doing is segregating the classes of the mind because you're taking low level education and you're not giving them all the tools that they need to progress to be better humans. And then what you're doing is you're telling them, okay, take this out, take this out, this out. You're going to be a worker that works for the government. And then you have high schools, like called entrepreneur high school, or you have all these uh, private schools that have harder learning. Um, they segregate those children, right? You can come here, you become a business owner. And it's because of your class, your family you come from can pay for the education to get you to become financially independent yeah. because it's a business thing. and ironically enough you got to pay through the nose to even get your kid in that class right and so if you're and not, so it's yeah. an art of it is artificially earned yeah um and that's also why you even look at our current like big top ceos and uh, major league billionaires they did not have higher education for the most part some of them yeah they got a bachelor's or a master's degree but their bachelor's and master's is not what they're in business on. Right. All they did was, 
you know, I got an idea. I'm going to go with it. Yeah. You know, even if it started off as a card table in someone's living room or um, some busted looking garage. I mean, I mean, Google, Microsoft, and even Amazon, they yeah. started out out of garages. Yeah. yeah. And they blew up into what they are. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, there's people that came up and seeing all that, like, oh, we can do this, we can do that. Yeah, well, there's only so much room in the world for these kind of businesses. And yeah. it's cutthroat. Yeah. And it's either you do well or you do not. Yeah. Okay. And that's because you have two people on two different planes, though. You have people on two different views. They want to help out each other humanly because it's the, it's what we know right. is and, right. <laughs> and even as society, people are looking at the rich like, oh, you should be doing this. You should be doing that. I'm like, this is my money. Why should I do a damn because thing you, you? Because it gets hard. You, you, you fight. So it's a competition too mm -hmm. and you finally get to the top and you're thinking to yourself i have the access to be able to let my mind relax right well okay well let's look at the example of bill and melinda okay they built microsoft okay they had all this money and they find a cause that they're interested in they did research on it before they did anything and what they did they did quietly they even built microsoft quietly and now we didn't realize it, but, oh, it's Microsoft. Everything's Microsoft. Yeah. And, yeah, there's all the stories of the cutthroat deals and the dynamics they had. But the reality is they created a great product that worked. They created um, charity organizations that grew small from very small, very purposeful. Yeah. And it grew. And they weren't loud about it. They simply did the work. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's with anything. As long as you are doing the work, like with this channel, you're on it. Yeah, you got a crazy busy schedule. You get three crazy monsters, and then you go to work, and more crazy monsters. <laughs> and even crazier monsters. <laughs> but then you make the time to do this. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it may take a minute. And there's behind-the-scenes stuff that Nobody's going to know about it. Nobody's going to hear about it. And let's be honest, not a lot of people are going to care about it. True. But it's a matter of doing the work and doing it well. Yeah. It doesn't matter how it looks or how it feels, but you're doing it. I wanted to do this project because it's more like a human awareness experiment for myself. I um, wanted people to start empathizing with other people. I'm so tired of people hearing different messages from other people or being stuck in broken situations because they don't understand and they don't have role models because there's no communication anymore. And then they don't have, um, I guess that communication with themselves or even that deductive reasoning, like, Hey, if I break this down properly, I feel like all that's gone. So I was making this as kind of like that side project, like, Hey, um, that person that you talked about the other day, who's been broken, who's been hurt, who's been going through hell, who's getting up every single day and running a successful business. I want you to know about them as a person. And, um, but no, um, with people, they don't understand each other anymore. They just see a person as a competition. I had this thought the other day. I've been wanting to say for like the longest time, if people could function like how they drive, I think it would just, just hear me out. So we're all I'm taught of California drivers. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about India drivers for some reason. I don't know why there's one place you go to and all the, yeah, right. But mm. think about it though. They're so trained within their driving. They can handle that crazy driving perfectly mm -hmm. without hurting each other. So that's what I thought about when it came to driving. We're all directed under one book on how to drive these vehicles, right? We all started off with horses and carriages. Now we're driving big metal objects that can possibly kill us every single day, unfortunately. Mm. So because of that, we're also taught multitasking because driving a vehicle is multitasking. So you're juggling multiple things in the car. Yeah, you're turning your head, you're turning the wheel, you're looking through the mirrors, you're looking around at everyone else. And if you're illegal, you go through your phone and text or you, <laughs> you find the next song for YouTube. Pretty much. Yeah. So the thing, the thing with it is that it's mainly focus, right? You're focusing on one, two, three, four, five different places at the same time. You're also focusing on the speedometer. You're focusing on the gas tank because the car won't work without it. You're focusing on the wheel because you got to turn it. You're focusing on the gear shift because you got to know. So all this is focus, right? 
But when you're in a, on the freeway and you're telling yourself you have to go 65 miles per hour, everybody on the freeway is already mentally um, adapted to having to go 65 miles per hour, right? So because of that, just some of them are. Right. But they're well, supposed to. Yeah, as I'm thinking of the people that are getting on and off the uh, yeah. freeway, it's like, all right, you got to get up to speed but or you can make progress. And if for that happens. But if you're doing 45 miles an hour and you're getting onto it. <laughs> right. And because of that, everybody around you has developed a sense of understanding of how to drive. Accidents happen because people don't want to develop the understanding of what the car in front of them is about to do. Right. That's what I see human nature as, is that we could function like how we drive if we focused on what the, I, it's that sense of understanding of everything around you, kind of like focusing on someone's body language, focusing on somebody's, if they're getting too tired and they don't want to talk anymore, if they feel like they're too exhausted, you can recognize that by how a person is talking. Sometimes people don't even want to talk to you. So you, you know how to take your exit and walk away. It's that respecting someone else, respecting yourself. It's everybody staying in their own lane in their type of way. But I know it's like the weirdest analogy ever, but it's just something I thought I've been thinking about and I've been trying to phrase it right. And it's still not coming out right. But it's just something I, I came to the thought of. But I know, I don't know if you want to keep, um, what's your final thoughts with everything? Kind of, because he knows me, I'll keep going. So <laughs> he's going to go ahead and fa- finish this for us because I'll, I'll just keep going. Um, yeah, we touched on a bunch of different areas, a bunch of different realms. Even my mind's going a couple of different areas. Um, but what I got to say for the main of this particular episode is no matter what's going on with you. And I know that's probably a bad way to bring that up, but it really doesn't, you know, it's your life. Are you going to live it? Or are you going to let other people live it for you or have someone else say, Oh, this is what you do and then do it. Yeah. And then in the back of your mind, Oh, uh, that really sucked. Um, and again, I know there's many different situations. And if we were to go into a rant or go into explain every different situation, we're not going to say anything. <laughs> yeah. So all I have to say is no matter what the relationship is, the business situation, the political situation, you have to make decisions no matter what the, but we all have to make decisions for ourselves, no matter what the political situation, the work situation, business situation, the social situation, whatever the situation, you have to make choices that are good for you and are good for the whole. Okay. And yeah, it's selfish to say, make the best decision for you. But if you make the best decision for you, you actually make the best decision for the society, for the group, for the whole. That way you're better able to interact with the next person better able to raise your child, better able to raise your dog or your cat or your lizard or whatever you got in the basement. <laughs> um, or better able to care for your grandmother in the wheelchair or go to the hospital to visit your family or whatever the situation may be. You got to be the, the best you you can be. And however that looks, I cheer it on. If you got a real problem that you can't get it figured out. Seek help. Yeah. You know, there's a suicide prevention hotline if you really need it. There's people out there that are willing to help. They're just waiting for you to say something. Even your the best friend you have that may be sitting next to you. And you're not saying a damn thing. <laughs> Say a damn thing. <laughs> but also you have to be careful who you talk to nowadays, too. Yeah. Again, that. That should go without saying. Yeah. Because, again, in that codependency mentality, you might open up to the wrong person. You might open up too much to the right person. Yeah, right, right. (laughs) And that can also be dangerous. But still, the main thing is, you got to find the healing. You got to heal yourself. You got to just figure this life out as best you can that actually contributes to your life and the society and isn't just doing something just to do something but doing something with a purpose um as far as you said if if joe had recognized as a child that he was in danger 
He absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, going to that, he absolutely did recognize that he was in danger, but he himself was so abused, and he didn't know what love was. Probably still doesn't. Um, he knows what it feels good, but if he had taken a moment and said and recognize that this was not right, we would not have the show you. <laughs> it's true. We would have Joe. Whoever. The bookstore clerk. <laughs> you know, he may not even be a bookstore clerk. He may be yeah. a camp counselor. He may true. be a drug and alcohol counselor. True. He could have found his calling somewhere else. Yeah, because I mean, as a lot of drug and alcohol counselors find, they came from that situation. Yeah. And they recognize the need of help. Kind of where I came from a very <clears throat> abusive situation myself. And instead of taking it out on my children or, you know, carrying on the same traits and patterns, I wanted to become a life coach mm -hmm. to help other people who've been through things and help them achieve a kind of a special awareness of themselves. Yeah. While I'm still working on myself as well, yeah. um, then I recognize I'm not going to be a perfect person because I'm not. I'm just not. But I also recognize that when I watch shows like this, that there are patterns everywhere. And we have people who deal with these same patterns every single day. So I just kind of want to help them assess and find themselves. Yes. Become, yeah, I'm helping them become better them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>